we were never supposed to be here. 48 kilometers past the Arctic Circle, the lone helicopter neared its target. According to the classified report she'd been graciously given, the facility wasn't even supposed to exist. Even from this angle, it wasn't much of a surprise to see that the majority of the structure was still covered in ice and debris from explosion, meaning rescue would likely take days, if not weeks, without the right resources. Even with that added bonus, the chances were slim. What were the odds that the scientists and other personnel below would even survive hours with limited oxygen? Beverly knew better than to voice her concerns, though. Her employers didn't pay her to ask questions. Take samples, catalog the findings, and eliminate all damaging evidence. That had been her mission statement for the past seven years. The pilot landed the helicopter near where her envoy was waiting, and she gathered her belongings, preparing herself for the harsh cold beyond. Not many dared to brave this pocket of the world, and most who did would likely be considered insane. Dr. Warren, welcome to sight, Levikin. The rescue team captain shouted over the noise of the copter as she landed. How much of the survey have you completed? She asked holding her mask over her face and following him to the bowels of the earth. My team has just finished placing the beacons, which will relay the radar images to us here. I wanted to wait for you to arrive before we perform the scan, he explained. She gave him a very condescending look. There are men and women that are struggling to survive below, Captain. Next time, don't wait for an audience when considering their lives. A few short moments later, the beacons activated and the monitor lit up with all kinds of data. Thankfully, despite the weather, the beacons were able to pick up the precise structure of the facility and the geothermal activity around it. Have you been able to determine what caused the collapse? Beverly asked. Initial reports tell us it was some kind of explosion near the North Observatory Tower. I believe most of the astronomical equipment was being kept there as well, so it's likely the Ulthar telescope that's been completely destroyed. Now that saddened her to hear, even though it wasn't unexpected. The entire Levikin facility was proposed for all kinds of scientific research, but she had always had an affinity for the stars. When the UN had provided the funding necessary to give the group the state-of-the-art astronomic equipment, she thought that it would be the first step towards new discoveries in the solar system. Now it was looking like only frustration and destruction had been meted out by these loner researchers. Do you believe it's possible that there might have been a spy among the team? Beverly asked as she checked the data herself. She wasn't sure if the captain had simply failed to mention it as a test of her own skills, but even a cursory glance at the blast analysis told her that this sort of collapse had to have been man-made. Someone inside the facility had deliberately sealed them in. We've speculated about that, but I think it's best to leave that sort of theory behind until we can attempt to make contact with any survivors, he responded. She gave him a curt nod and passed the tablet back before remarking. Then let's begin immediately. 1900 hours. Point of entry was determined by the scene to be viable near the western entrance of the site. A long series of chasms ran through the ice split apart by a wide, sloshy river that plummeted into the depths of the Arctic. The only obstacle that currently prevented the team from entering was already being drilled into the massive rescue vehicle. It's loud thundering on the wall enough to wake the dead. Fifteen meters left, Operational Supervisor Yuri Sakamon announced as they paused the drill to let it cool down. Despite the freezing temperatures, they can only use it in short ten-minute intervals to avoid overheating the battery. How many physicians do you have on staff? Beverly asked as she stood on a nearby observational platform and looked down another one of those deep pits. It was dizzying to imagine that these miners went into the ice at least three times a week for all kinds of material, everything from geological finds to fossil fuels. All of my team is trained in proper first aid, and CPR, if that's what you mean, the captain answered. I'm not one to give up on human life, she replied curtly. She put her safety goggles back on and watched the drill finish its work. The raw, dark hallways of the site becoming visible moments later as the ice sheet fell apart. An hour later, they were moving in. The western sector was for residential, recreational centers. Looks like all this is in good repair, the one commented as they checked the first series of rooms. Or never used at all. As they arrived at the next depth marker, 
The captain raised a hand for them to pause and remarked, Oxygen will begin to grow thinner as we get further in. We'll be advised if we remain together and keep communications to a minimum. Remember, we only have six hours of breathable air, so moving fast from area to area will be our best interest. Were most of the survivors near the Northern Tower? She asked. As far as we know, the Levicon site was running on a skeleton crew at the moment. Full operations were meant to begin this October. I'm guessing that won't be happening now, he said. Once the entire room was depressurized, all the team entered a freight elevator, and computer specialist Anthony Maxlin began working on getting it restarted. There'll be several generators. Only one of them's currently online. Rerouting power might take a little bit of time, Anthony exclaimed. Work your magic, the captain reassured him as he placed his assault rifle down. Doing so gave her a moment to inquire about it. Did the UN authorize weapons in the event of hostile takeover? She whispered. He gave her a short but discerning nod. It's pointless not to bring up the obvious. We've been circling around the subject ever since you arrived, Doctor. Clearly someone on the team didn't want their findings to come to light and took it upon themselves to sabotage this entire mission. We have no way of knowing if that person's still alive or not. Protecting ourselves is my top priority here. Shoot first, ask questions later, hmm? I'll attempt to remain peaceful towards all of them as long as necessary, he said firmly. She considered another query when the elevator jerked to life and the freight doors slammed shut. They were on the move to the northern tower. No turning back, Maxlin teased as he grabbed his own weapon. He was doing his best not to seem nervous. None of them knew what to expect up ahead. 2200 hours. There was darkness, foreboding, and even the scent of death. It also looked foreign, strange architectural designs that shouldn't have been made for any human run oblong down the side of the walls, as though they had simply repurposed a far older ruin. The moment the elevator came to a halt, they saw a few bodies frozen on the ground, likely exposed to the initial blast. At least their suffering was quick, she thought, as she followed the rescue team down the eastern corridor. Most of the rooms were completely collapsed, piles of rubble pushing into the main structure. It was already beginning to look like there weren't going to be any living survivors. Soon they reached one of the main data centers, a row of monitors flickering on and off from the last little bits of power that were flowing through. And Beverly noticed that several of the displays were showing what appeared to be satellite readings. Does anyone happen to know what they were working on before the event? She asked out loud. It was at that moment she realized... She'd wandered off from the group. The room was silent, except for her and the echoes of her fingers clicking against the dusty keyboard. A few failed passwords later, she was into what remained of their findings. Looks like someone tried to wipe this memory, she realized as she worked into the decorrupted files. Then abruptly, the power came on entirely. Dr. Warren, in here! There's something you might want to see! A voice from the next room over called to her. Soon, she was awestruck the impressive planetarium that was on display. It was clearly far more advanced than any technology she was familiar with, but it also looked old, perhaps even older than all of them combined. There were planets and stars that she didn't recognize, and the holographic readings only further confused her. Am I reading this correctly? She asked. The captain took a look as well. <laughs> Might as well be asking me to translate Greek. He laughed back. It's weird that this room was not destroyed, right? Everything above us is totally collapsed. Structural integrity is holding at about 58%, the soldier added after finishing his scans. So far, we've found six bodies from the manifest. That leaves Commander George Arwen, Chief Astronomer Howard Curin, and Chief Physician Marjorie Lang as unaccounted for. How much more of this facility do you think is intact? Yuri asked as he returned from the Eastern Conference Room. Spread out and search, Doctor. I take it you wish to remain here to gather clues? Captain asked. She gave him a nod, waving him off. After several attempts to simulate a cycle from the system on the display, she watched as the holograms circled around the star in question until suddenly freezing in place, glitching because the data went back no further. 
and then she saw it. A bold and white orbiting planet that fell into place from beyond. It was no bigger than their own, peaceful and isolated all at once. Speeding the simulation forward, her eyes watched as the little planet seemed to flourish with life, changing from pale white to a familiar bluish green. They called it Octurn, the living planet, a voice said from the shadows. Who are you? she asked, her hands shaking as she realized this had to be a survivor. Down here, with no food for nearly a week, she could see blood coating his hands and mouth evidence of cannibalism in his crazed eyes. Kieran, and you must be Dr. Beverly Warren from the university, he said with a smile. He sounded almost excited to realize who she was. You know me, she asked carefully. I know of you, and I recognize why you are here and welcome it. Surely, You've seen by now why I took the steps necessary to seal us in this icy tomb, Kirwan said, taking a step closer. You do realize you just confessed to several crimes? He flailed his head back and laughed madly before pointing at the holographic display. And what about them, Doctor? Are you also going to charge them with crimes? She pursed her lips together. I'm not following you. Don't lie to me! Do not insult my intelligence, he said as he got right next to her. Then he activated the sequence again, and they both watched as the data showed what happened next. And Kira narrated. The quiet planet was about to reach for the stars. They even designed this entire structure to communicate with the heavens. And what did they get in return? A dark moon appeared, hurling towards the planet like a bolt of lightning. And then it was trapped in the cycle of the blue planet. I don't understand what I'm seeing, she admitted. Octurn society was invaded by an exoplanet. The newcomers took to their world, their technology, and they killed any survivors. This isn't possible, Bev admitted. I think you'll find that the satellite imagery is accurate. 66 million years ago. Humans were the invasive species of this world. A parasite taking hold of their world, killing the original hosts, Kieran spat. If what you're saying is true, there should be evidence on the moon of its origins, she whispered. Kieran gestured above towards the collapsed observatory. Why do you think I had to do this? If word got out that humanity was in fact alien, What do you think would happen? Our very existence would be shaken. The entire human race has been nothing but a lie. (laughs) He laughed. If your goal was to make sure this information never got out, you failed. Whole world would know about this soon enough, one of the rescuers said as they entered the room from behind Kirwan. What I did was an invitation for people like you, Dr. Warren. You see, before the blast, we uncovered evidence of the Octurnians still here on Earth, the madman answered. They've been waiting a long time to take back their home, he snarled. Suddenly his body began to twitch as though something within was desperate to break free. She could hear bones breaking, skin tearing apart as he fell over in pain, a bulging mass of spores pushing themselves out of his flesh. Then his team tried to open fire on Kirwan. It had the opposite of the intended result. The spores burst out, scattering strange black mists of toxic fumes into the air as Kirwan let out what sounded like a scream of pleasure. Beverly stumbled away from the shadowy fog, watching as the two men suddenly began to choke on it, their bodies actually withering as the strange material engulfed them. Immediately, she sealed the room off. Moments later, the captain and the others returned from the rest of the facility, mortified at what they saw. Their companions were slowly being melted alive by the spores, their thrashing bodies fusing with the floor as a purple mucus oozed from Kirwan. Looked like it was filled with eggs. We need to leave this place immediately, Beverly insisted. We managed to discover what was left of Marjorie's body. You wish to take it back to the surface for an autopsy? Anthony asked. 
She went over to the gurney where the half-eaten corpse was laying and checked it quickly for any signs of possible infection. It's too risky. Whatever this is, it's been trapped here for centuries and evolved to use our bodies as host. We can't allow any of the remnants to come to the surface, she insisted. Oh, 0200 hours. The journey back was silent, filled with melancholy. Their comrades dead, entering the freight elevator to return felt like it was giving up on some of the rescue team. But they didn't know what Dr. Warren had learned. She gave a full report to them as the elevator moved away from the North Sector, including the bold claims Kirwan had made. The astronomers were likely able to make contact with these aliens somehow. This facility must have been their last resort for survival millennia ago. And Kirwan, in a last-ditch effort to save mankind, impacted the tower, he said with a nod. I think not. I believe he wanted us to come here. It was an alluring trap. The survivors were the bait. I think the Acturian infected him first and hoped that by bringing others here, they could find a way to escape. If they were to spread themselves beyond this strange prison, why not simply do so in secrecy? I'm not sure. Kirwan claimed that he wanted people like me to know the truth. You suppose now that the world will be ready for the damning truth about humanity? It'll change everything we ever knew about ourselves. These reports will need to be classified. What was left of Octurn died here today. We can't let the world crumble simply because our society has made mistakes in its past. But surely you must see that eventually this whole charade will crumble. And if there are other things left from them that we have hidden, what will you then? And what if the leaders of our world are all part of this grand conspiracy? Was it possible that Kieran knew the powers that were in charge of their own life would openly suppress this information? Was he appealing to her for another reason? Hoping that she would be a traitor to her own kind? Unless... She looked down at her own skin. A dreadful thought forming as she realized she had been the only one unaffected by the spores down below. Was she not as human as she believed? Then she saw the captain's fingers slowly reach towards his weapon. We tell no one, she reiterated. He relaxed and the elevator moved them closer to the surface, but slowly as she caught glimpses of the sun and her mind wandered towards possibilities of alien children millennia ago, looking up and basking in its rays. She realized that would not be the end of the story of Acturn. She looked at the fading shadow of the moon, the secret exoplanet the invasive humans had come here on, and knew that silence would mean that the truth could not be spoken. Now, this world was once theirs, and by my hand it will be again, she thought. I will tell every one of their songs, and slowly, we will remember what it was like to live. Hey there, kids, it's me. Mr. Goo Pasta, I want to tell you thank you so much for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to today's episode of the podcast on the podcast, you know, depending on where exactly you're listening or watching. If you're on YouTube, hey, I would very much appreciate it if you guys clicked the like on this video, if you guys left a comment of what your favorite story is, and if you guys hit that subscribe button, you can also hit the bell, but I don't know what that does. So I think it's broken still, but hey, it helps. And if you're on the podcast, I'd very much appreciate it if you hit subscribe on the podcast or or like on the podcast. I don't know if you can like podcasts, but if you can, hey, that's something I'd appreciate. And of course, like always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who supports me at patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. You guys, as always, are the main MVPs of this 
story of every night's story and you guys help me keep the lights on here so without further ado i want to give a very big thank you to jordan alexander sanchez stephanie butler bobby carmen tanya oren tristan pelton chance burnett diana kraus that one guy lupita galvin that creepy chick tyler fletcher rebecca harper murky moo red shadow cat xavier the cheyenne demix sean caddo baker six gay rats in a trench coat turtle man rob like sharp things chaos art cryolinian milk and meal zachary graphius gorang tramagasi maria walker pain gravy crazy kid mr marcus Blitz. Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, Guy Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Trickin, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Zicardi, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pan. Cake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiwi the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Guy Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so very, very much. Thank all of you who are in the description down below, and honestly, thank all of you that can give anything, even when it comes down to just one dollar. I appreciate you guys very, very much. I love all of you, and I love all of you out there who are listening, liking, subscribing, doing all that good jazz. Sweet dreams.